Good evening. Boy, of all the things I get up here, and I like this one. You better claim it, or I might be wearing it tomorrow. I hadn't worn a watch since I moved here much, but uh, that color sure would be my color. I like it. Those of you CYC, welcome back. Glad to have you. Hope you had a great weekend. Let me tell you what my Halls rapper says. Y'all are in the dark and... The point, all you need to know is go out and buy a pack of red halls this week and bring them to me. My halls wrapper tonight says, march forward. March forward. It says, turn can do into can did. I like that one. It says, high five yourself. Yeah, I like that. I like that. See, see what you can get out of a halls? You just never know. So in Job chapter 16, that's where I'm at, and I'm asking this question. What is the question I'm asking? Somebody tell me. Ah, see, I flipped it on you there. How about this question? What did Job consider his prayer to be? Pure, Pure, so you know the answer. Or remember the question too, right? Because over at Lads, they might say Job's what was pure? His prayer, right? I'm in Job chapter 17 now, moving very rapidly, and Job had suffered a lot, and something had grown dim. What was it? His eyes. His eyes had grown dim due to all the suffering. You see the, see the imagery there. I didn't really, uh, not that chapter 18 is not important, just didn't pull any questions out of there. I go over to, I go over to chapter 19. At the end of chapter 19, Job Job knew that somebody lived. Who was it? My Redeemer. I know that my Redeemer lives. In the first part of Job chapter 19, Job said his friends had reproached him how many times? Ten times. That'd be about verse 3 and about verse 25 of the book of Job. My friends have reproached me ten times. He, He just didn't feel real comforted by them, did he? They hadn't really helped him a whole lot. And so, so good job there. I, I heard answers to all four questions. So proud of you. Keep studying. You're doing well. Our word for tonight is kindness. Kindness. Alexander McLaren said that this is what makes people attractive. This is what makes people attractive. Well, now, wait a minute. I thought pretty eyes and and pretty hair, and and the right height, and the right weight, and I thought all of that, those types of things made, made people attractive. No, no, no. No, kindness makes people attractive. I thought, I thought it was about makeup, and about, you know, smelling good, and, and, and all of those things. No, 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 no. No, what makes people attractive is kindness. He went on to say that If you want to win the world, it'll happen a lot easier by melting it than it will hammering it. Now you think about that. You think about the hearts and lives of people. He says that we can win the world a lot easier by melting their hearts as opposed to hammering them. How are we going to melt their hearts? Well, the word is kindness. Kindness. I don't, I don't take the time in these lessons to try to define all these words. I think that the definitions are pretty straightforward for the most part of these words. We understand what, what kindness is. Another gentleman said, kindness is the language that the deaf can hear and the mute can speak. Kindness is the language that the deaf can hear and the mute can speak. So we look around our world today and and we live in a world of of partisan politics. We live in a world of war. We live in a world of turmoil. We live in a world of upheaval. We live in a world of uncertainty. We live in a world of difficulty. We live in a world of marital failure like never before. We live in a world of, of... a lack of understanding of biblical principles. We live in a world where immorality is being promoted left and right, where people are calling evil good and good evil. 
what, what can we do? What, what's it going to take? What's, what's our best motive? What's our best effort? Obviously, obviously we, we understand the gospel message, but how, how are we going to get there? How are we going to make a difference or make an impact in the world? Could I suggest to you tonight that it all starts with, all starts with kindness? Kindness. You, you can put whatever, you can put good deeds. You know that song, each day I'll do a, a golden deed. You, you can call them good deeds for others. You, you can call it uh, a righteous action. You can call it love. That's what you want to call it. You can call it caring. You could call it sharing. You could call it just simply goodness. You could call it gentleness if you wanted to. You could call it being mild or meek or humble or lowly. I don't care what, what type of word or synonym you want to use there. It comes back to this idea of being kind. And so as we just kind of flow through the Bible, what, is, what does the Bible say about kindness and how does it look? Well, I, I, I had a, a, a fairly difficult Bible reading tonight, number one, because it was steep, but number two, because I wanted you to see the flow of Ruth, be reminded of the story of Ruth. And, and in the story of all the other things that we see, we we, we could highlight Ruth's loyalty. We could highlight Naomi's steadfastness. We could highlight Boaz's uh, companionship. We could highlight Boaz's sympathy. We could, we could highlight a lot of things. Among those would be kindness. Kindness on the part of Boaz. Kindness on the part of, Na- on the part of Ruth toward Naomi. Kindness on the part of the other ladies in their circle, whatever, ever how many there were. Because what happens is, as Steve began to read in chapter 1, Ruth and Naomi come back into Bethlehem, and, and these ladies gather, and they begin to, you know, Naomi, it's good to see you. Naomi, welcome back. Naomi, where where you been? Naomi, how you been doing? And, and in chapter 1, Naomi says, no, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Because the Lord has dealt bitter. The Lord sent me away full, but He's, he's brought me back empty. That's the way she felt. Don't, don't, don't blame her. Don't throw rocks at her. She's just admitting her. I, I don't feel like I, I've been treated very well. And, and life hasn't been very fair for me since I left here due to the famine. But then in chapter 2, as, as Steve jumped over there and caught about three verses there in the middle of chapter 2, after Ruth is asked to go out in the field, then she meets Boaz, and Boaz says, Yes, ma'am, you gather in my fields. Not only do you gather in my fields, but hey, when my servants go in to eat, you go in and eat with them. You go in and dine at the table with my servants. Not only does he do that, but then he says to, the, to, the, to his hired servants, Hey, you take care of this young lady. You see that she gets plenty. As a matter of fact, you spill a little on purpose. I see all that's kindness. You call it whatever you want to call it. You can call it accidental spilling. You can call it providential care from God. I don't care what you call it. It's kindness on the part of Boaz. He goes on to say, now, ma'am, you just come on back tomorrow and you come on back the next day. You you just gather here till, till we get done with harvest. You're more than welcome. Not only that, when she went to leave for that day, he gave her six ephahs of barley to go home with, right? Just, just spread your apron out here and let's just pour them full. And she goes back and she reports that to Naomi. And, and that's when Noah, Naomi says, Blessed be the man who has treated you. And then chapter 2 ends by, by Naomi telling Ruth, Now you stay there because he's going to protect you. He's one of our relatives. He's going to provide. He's going to see that we get food. See, all that's, all that's what kindness, that's what it looks like. Then in chapter 4, when all of that transpires and, and Ruth and Boaz end up marrying, they have a child. Now here comes these ladies back in, whomever they are, and they name this child. It's kind of intriguing to me if you want to know my opinion. That they named the child Obed. And these women are gathered around and they're, they're telling Naomi, He'll be a restorer of life. 
You'll be a nourishment to your old age. You see the progress of the story? Just, just catching those snapshots. It's a story of kindness. That's, that's what it looks like. In the book of Ruth, that's how it acts. There are other passages in the Old Testament that deal with this idea of mercy or kindness or, or loving kindness. Mean, about 250 times that this word appears in the Old Testament. 42 of those deal with God's mercy and how it endures, or God's kindness rather, and how it endures forever. God's kindness that never ceases to be. As long as God is, God will be kind. That's the idea behind 42 of those 250 plus times that we find it in the Old Testament. God's kindness endures. God's mercy, God's loving kindness endures forever. In Proverbs 31, in verse 26, you remember this is the passage about the virtuous woman. And notice what the wise man says about her in verse 26. She opens her mouth in wisdom, but notice what is on her tongue. The teaching of kindness. This is, this is that context where we say, hey ladies, if you really want to get life right, you need to get like this lady. If you really want to aspire to be something successful and great, then read Proverbs 31. Look at what this lady did and how she was admired and honored for doing so. Look at how she conducted herself and, and, and carried herself and provided and, and did those things. If you want to do well, ladies, follow this pattern. There's a lot in this pattern, but for our purposes tonight, we're pulling out this on her tongue. She teaches kindness. When she speaks, she speaks kindness. I, I love the question. It's a loaded question, but I love the question. What does God require of me? We're still asking that question today. What's, what's God require of me? You know, if you could just, preacher, if you could just tell me what God requires of me, then I'd just do that. And, you know, I think about that rich young ruler that came to Jesus. What do you ask him? What do you require of me? Oh, he might have said some different words. I got you, but some different words are said to me sometimes, you know, like, what do I got to do to go to heaven? You know what people's asking? What does God require of me? It's a loaded question. I hate the question, by the way. Because what you're really asking, here's what you're really asking. But this is all free, okay? And this is why you get out late tonight. That This is all free. The reason why it's a question I don't like is because really what you're saying is, what can I get by with? What can I get by with? That's what you're really asking. Most of the time, that's what they really, they want to know, what's the least I can do to, to, to achieve heaven? What have I got to do? What does God require of me? Well, in the days of Micah, they were asking that question. In Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, the beginning part of the verse says, what does the Lord require of us? That's a pretty straightforward question. Let me tell you what He requires of us. Micah answers it. You need to do justice. Do justice to what? Do justice how often? Do, do justice on, on, on what day, right? To whom? Where? When? Why? They say, again, we're trying to get to the minimum of this thing here. No, you do justly. That means every waking moment of every day, you conduct yourself in a just manner. You love kindness. When? What day? How much? Where? To who? Is there a time when I can't? Can I stop? When do I get through? When is it full? How much is enough? When is enough? Can you give me a number? How many deeds? Each day I'll do a golden deed. You know what A is? A is an article. It happens to be singular right there, right? A golden deed. So I'm one and I'm done. It did say golden deeds. Did you notice that? I'll do a golden deed. So I'll do one and I'm done. So what you're really asking is, what's the minimum, see? 
Micah says, love kindness. How often? Every waking moment of every day. Be kind. Love being kind. Be kind in your actions, your words, your thoughts. And then finally, walk humbly with your God. Makes a wonderful three-point sermon. One, two, three. What do you got to do to go to heaven? Walk humbly, number three. When? How often? At what time? In what circumstances? What day of the week? With whom? Is there ever time I can stop being humble? Can I walk pridefully when here, there, you know? Again, trying to get to the minimum, you know? The answer is walk humbly with God every waking moment of every day. Do justice, love, kindness. And walk humbly with God. Well, I come over to the New Testament. And I don't find the word as much. Which isn't all that surprising. But there are four words that are translated kindness in the New Testament. And you have a lot of compound words. That I don't think are hitting this twelve. And so... The, the, Greeks are, the, the Greek language is a little more sophisticated, so I don't think this number 12 is just entirely accurate. But think about these four different words, and this is how they're translated in definition. And then you have all these derivatives of these four words. And so so the, the New Testament is full of this idea of kindness. But in this, in this search for the word, came up 12 times. It's translated good. Good. It's translated to be mild or gentle. It's translated to be benevolent to war. All these things are not surprising at all. The fourth one's translated gracious or goodness. And, and, in, and involved in this is this inherent moral desire to be righteous. There's this there's this moral element of, I, I'm doing this not to get ahead. I'm not doing this to look good. I'm not doing this to make you think more of me. I, I'm not doing this to pat myself on the back. I'm not doing this to pad my portfolio in the eyes of God. I'm doing this because it's morally right. And it's what God asks of me. And it's just who I want to be. Have I told you about my friend Mamie Adams? Mamie Adams was an older sister who enjoyed going to the post office. You know, life gets simpler as you get older, I, I hope. The... Uh, the line was long. It was right before Christmas. Mamie Adams went to the post office in town because the people were friendly in town. Only reason she went to the post office was to get stamps. One day, the post office shook the entire world of Mamie Adams. They installed a stamp machine in the lobby. One day she was standing in line, long line. The gentleman behind her says, Ma'am, uh, you're just in line to get stamps? Yes, sir. He said, well, you know that machine over there will, will give you stamps and you won't have to stand in this line. And she said, Yes, sir, I realize that, but that machine over there won't ask me about my arthritis. See, some people's just looking for, that's, that's what they need. That's exactly what they need. You know, if they wanted a machine, they'd, they'd go visit a machine. But they're looking for a person. They're looking for somebody who, who has this um, inherent moral desire to... to to be caring and sharing, not, not, because, not because we've got an agenda, but just because that's who we want to be. That's how we want to be recognized. That's how we want to be known as those types of people who care and are, and are kind 
As you look through the New Testament, I, I didn't pull them all out, but just a few that are probably familiar. When you see this word kindness, in Romans 11 and verse 22, King James Version says goodness. Now consider the goodness and severity of God. This translation says, now consider the kindness. Consider the kindness and sternness of God. Kindness to you provided that you continue in His kindness. Or if you prefer goodness, goodness to you provided that you continue in His goodness. Same, same idea. In other words, God has two sides and we need to recognize both of them. God can be stern. God can also be kind. He can be merciful, and He can be gracious. And, and ultimately, we get to decide which side of Him we receive by how we conduct our own lives. If we show kindness to others, God will, excuse me, God will show kindness to us. Another one I think about is found in Titus chapter 3. And here it gets very pointed as to what God's goodness, or God's kindness rather, has accomplished. Titus 3 and verse 4. But when the kindness and love, no doubt, of God, our Savior appeared, He saved us. I just stop right there and just ask somebody, what saved you? The blood of Jesus. Okay, good answer. What saved you? The love of God. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. That's a good answer. Do we ever stop and consider that involved in God's love and the blood of Jesus is, is His kindness, His goodness, His benevolence toward us? God is extending to us something that we didn't deserve. His mild and gentle attitude toward us all wrapped up in the fact that we can be saved Paul makes it very clear to Titus as he goes on in verse 5 it's all because of God's mercy it's not because you're righteous it's because God is kind and it's because God loves you it's in first Peter chapter 2 and in verse 3 verse 2 says as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that they may grow thereby if indeed you have tasted look at verse 3 that the Lord is gracious that's one of those words for kindness the word gracious and maybe some translations translate it kindness first Peter 2 and verse 3 if indeed you have experienced if you have tasted to carry on the metaphor of drinking the pure milk of the Word. If indeed you have drank of the Lord and tasted that kind, gentle goodness of God. Realizing that the Lord is, the Lord is gracious. Maybe the most well known in terms of kindness in the New Testament is the fruit of the Spirit. Among which is kindness. And listed right behind kindness is goodness. And they are two different words. And they have two different meanings. Even though sometimes kindness is translated goodness. The idea here is to be full of benevolence toward in an effort to keep oneself morally pure. Fruit of the Spirit, kindness. To be benevolent toward in an effort to keep oneself morally pure. All these other things, very, very important. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. All of these things. Paul goes on to say, against such there is no law. And then one more. Colossians 3 and verse 12. 
First 11 verses of Colossians chapter 3, Paul is saying, okay, now as a servant of God, now as a servant of Christ, now as a child of God, now as one belonging to the family, as those who have become a part of the sanctified, the saints, the holy ones, the set apart ones, here's what you need to do. Therefore, therefore, it's there because of the first 11 verses don't miss them because of the blood of Jesus and because of the redemption that you enjoy Colossians 3 verses 1 through 11 here's what you need to do you need to put on as if as if we're saying to clothe yourself so that you might be holy clothe yourself with what clothe yourself with compassion Clothe yourself with kindness. Clothe yourself with humility. Clothe yourself with gentleness and patience. Put on, literally wrap yourself with kindness, goodness, gentleness, benevolence toward, the willing to share the actions of sincere, genuine Love and care for another. My, my favorite in all of the New Testament is Ephesians 4 and verse 32. Be ye, be ye kind to one another. I want to know what that looks like. It's tenderheartedness. I want to know what that looks like. It's forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. The author of my lesson on kindness in, in my book, my one word book, he closed out his lesson by saying this. Let me give you three rules for life. Let me give you three rules for life. Number one, be kind. Number two, be kind. I bet you can guess number three, can't you? Number three, be kind. Be kind. Some have had that poem, be kinder than necessary and sweeter than required. Kinder than necessary, sweeter than required. I go back to Ephesians 4 and verse 32, and and we we emphasize kindness. Paul, what's your... What's your main emphasis here as you close out the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians? Which is a chapter filled with, go back to verse 19 through 21, and it's a chapter filled with put off the old man, put on the new man, take off the old man, throw away the old man, get rid of the old man. Let me tell you a little bit about the old man. It's filled with lies. It's filled with unfaithfulness. It's filled with perverse lips. It's filled with corrupt talk. It's filled with dirty and crude joking. You get rid of all that. Read Ephesians 4, verses 22 through 29. You get rid of all that. And you put on the new man. What's the new man look like? It's clothed with truth. It's clothed with faithfulness. Put away lying and falsehood and and fill your mouth with those things that are for building up, edify of one another. Paul says, "Let let me just put a summary on all of this. In verse 32, he just says, be kind to one another. Be kind to one another. Paul, what's that? Define that for me, would you? I can define it in two ways with the same verse. Number one, it's about being tender hearted. If you're trying to win the world, if that's what we're really trying to do, if it's not going very well, it may be because we're using a hammer. Maybe we need to put the hammer down and try to melt that heart by being tenderhearted ourselves. The only way you're going to convert a heart is to get it tender. And it might start with you and I Getting our hearts tender. Maybe we're callous. Maybe we're hard. Maybe maybe life has 
has closed us in and, and made us hard-hearted in certain areas, in certain ways. Maybe, maybe we, I'm not saying give up the truth, and I'm not saying leave the gospel behind. I'm just saying search your heart and ask yourself, am I treating others with a tender heart? And then the second way to define kindness according to Ephesians 4 and verse 32 is to forgive. To forgive. As God in Christ has forgiven you. Be kind. Are we being kind? I hope so. Do people know us as people of kindness? I, I really do hope so. Hope you enjoy your devotionals this week. I hope it broadens your horizon to the word kindness. And if you'll allow me, just to put in a shameless plug here. On the radio, every day this week and every day of every week, I, I'm covering the same word. So if you want another devotional, tune in to 97.5, and that's what will really matter for today. It will be on kindness all five days this week. It's important that we be kind. That we be kind to one another. Who does that include? That includes everybody, doesn't it? Be kind to one another. Through being tender-hearted and forgiving. The only way that I'm convinced we can truly be what God wants us to be is to let Him have our lives. And if you're still trying to hold on, it might be that you're struggling with kindness because you're still trying to hold on. So tonight as we sing this song, let, let, let God take over. Let Him take over. Let Him work through you. And I promise you, it'll be easier to be tender-hearted and forgiving. Let God. Let God make you what He wants you to be. Let God have all of you. If we can help you with that, would you come right now?